the American walks every day normal going to work. He's walking down town in Manhattan and all of a sudden two planes hit the Twin Towers and they have no clue why would somebody do such a thing. The deliberate and deadly attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. Radical Islam has declared the war. Radical Islam is at war now with the West. When I saw the second airplane hit, I knew jihad has come to America. in Istanbul, and now in Madrid, are close to home for all of us. The tentacles of terrorism are reaching out to every corner of the world. London's worst attack since the Second World War, a series of blasts rocked the capital during the busy morning rush hour. A shocking toll of dead and injured, dozens are described as in a critical condition. Beslan School number one is a scene of carnage tonight. Hundreds of children are feared dead. Every single country in the world is dealing with this on one level or another. You see that the Thais are dealing with it, you see that the Filipinos are dealing with it, the Europeans are dealing with it in Madrid, the Russians are dealing with it in Chechnya, and the British are dealing with it in London and in Manchester. And of course you see in the Middle East, whether it's in Iraq, in Iran, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Egypt, and of course in Israel, in Saudi Arabia, and you go to Africa and you see that jihadis are operating everywhere from Djibouti to South Africa. All of these areas that we refer to as separate wars, the Palestinian war in Israel, the Iraq war, they see all of these not as specific wars, but as fronts in a global jihad. in paradise. Right now it looks all too possible.
بدماء وأشلاء أطفالنا وعذابات أسراقا وسنمضي نفجر أجسادنا We need to understand the culture that produced terrorism. Nani Darwish is no stranger to terror. She was born in Egypt and grew up in the Gaza Strip. In the 50s, her father headed Fedayeen terror operations against Israel. Some people view the current situation with the Middle East as a clash of civilization. I think it's more than that, way more than that. I think it's an outright declaration of war from radical Islam on Western culture, on the Judeo-Christian culture, and we should know that. It's a declaration of war. These bombings are taking place not because someone likes to see bodies and uh, count uh, casualties, it's part of a campaign of jihad, holy war, to bring down the West, to undermine the very foundations of Christianity and Judaism. The Islamists hate everything other than what they are themselves. Um, they killed, for example, over 100,000 Algerians who disagreed with their brand of Islam. These are fellow Muslims. There is a particular strand of Islam that has in fact challenged what I think is the absolutely central pillar of, uh, of human civilization as such, namely the sacredness of life itself. <laughs> All of our countries have suffered from the impact of terrorism. Those responsible have no respect for human life. I can tell you that as a Muslim, I feel very worried and I feel very concerned. Uh, I'm ashamed actually because I feel that Islam has been hijacked by different fanatic groups. Most people don't realize that Muslims are also victims because if they disagree they get killed. Would some Muslim or some Arab who in his heart believes that the Arab terrorism is terrorism can he say it in publicly? He will be lynched in a Muslim society if he says that Hamas is a terrorist. What is worrying is that there is a silent majority that is not speaking out in a very strong voice against these groups. And I hope it's only out of fear and not out of sympathy with people like Osama bin Laden or Abu Musab Zarqawi. <laughs> The question then becomes, what percentage of the Islamic world supports jihad and could be considered radicals or Islamic fundamentalists? The Muslim world consists of more than one billion people and it's very difficult to tell what percentage of this one billion supports Al-Qaeda or Zarqawi or other terrorist groups. <laughs> I would estimate that some 10 to 15 percent, and let me stress it's an estimate, of Muslims worldwide support militant Islam. That is not to say that only 10 to 15 percent are anti-American or anti-Zionist. No, that's much larger. One point two billion Muslims out there with 15 percent, this is a huge number. This is as big as the United States of America. And the, the bad thing about it is that they're spread all throughout.
In the Middle East, Islam is our identity, is our political life, it's our social life, it's our life. As a child, I attended uh, Gaza elementary schools. And uh, we were taught that jihad is a religious holy war for the sake of Allah. That's what it is, to conquer the world for Allah. That is jihad. These are actual scenes broadcast on Arab television. Daily, my uh, classmates would recite poetry, jihadist poetry. And when they recited it, they were crying. They were uh, wishing shahada, to be shaheed, to die as a martyr, to die in jihad. I would summarize the struggle today between radical Islam and the West with the phrase from a Jordanian school book and also a Palestinian school book. And the teaching in Islamic education is this religion will destroy all other religions through the Islamic Jihad fighters. It's Islam against the other religions. It shows how mainstream some of these concepts which are seen as radical Islam have become uh, or are in the mainstream Arab world today. Radical Islamic proponents believe that the West has been engaged in a conspiracy to subjugate Islam. What they are saying is the United States is a threat, is a danger to them, is trying to dominate them, is trying to turn the whole world into America, and this is what they are telling their people they have to fight against. And therefore, uh, it is obligatory of Muslims to strike back. The West needs to be defeated one way or another. وظیفه هر مسلمان و هر غیرتمند غیر مسلمانی است که در مقابل آمریکا و امراکیان و انگلیسیا و اسرائیل ها بیسته و هر کجا اینا منافعی دارن منافعشون رو باید به خطر بندازن ما يملك من يملك ان يقول كلمه في الجهاد الحق هذا ضد المحتل ويقدم بيوت ويقدم شباب وتقدم تضرب رقاب وتنسف جماجم هذا خط النصر والشهاده والتضحيه I mean there in lies the issue of the threat of militant Islam, the anointed right to carry out executions um, of anybody who is considered a threat to Islam itself. The word jihad in the Muslim vocabulary, in the Muslim consciousness, is a very powerful word. First of all, the word jihad in literal Arabic basically means a struggle. Coming from the word jihada, to, to struggle. Jihad in the traditional sense means self struggle. Look within yourself to try and make yourself a better person. People think about it, yes, jihad does mean self-struggle, struggle within. But so does Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf means my struggle. But what struggle? Nazism had a struggle with what? What did the Jews do to tango in Nazi Germany? Jihad is being used in the Middle East as struggle with the Jewish people. Struggle with the West. The 
والبينات ربيبة ومصنع الكيان الله أكبر لو أذن الله لنا يا أمة محمد سيقول حتى الحجر يا مسلم هذا يهودي خلفي تعال وقع مسا ونحن نقطعها والله لا نقطعها أيها اليهود الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الجهاد في سبيل الله الجهاد في سبيل الله بريطاني انتزع قلب عجوز بعدما طعنه وشرب من دمها هناك ناس مهوسون بمص دماء كبار السن فهؤلاء وحوش على شكل بشر The main theme in most of the Arab media is hostility to Israel and the United States and the West in the Arab media there is a uh, process of demonizing Jews and the West. There is widespread use of this theme of portraying Israel and the United States as Satan. And this is a, an integral part of Arab uh, Islamist propaganda. The amount of hate propaganda is far more extensive and pervasive than the attention it has received in the Western media. In Marbar America, I can marry the Momo Miguyan. In Meslehamon, I was of a law in a shaitan regime as a that a Valahar Surah or on the right cheese. یک لحظه از یاد نبرد که شیطان آماده حمله به او و انهدام حسار معنوی و ایمانی اوست این مرگ بر آمریکان برای همینه After 9/11 a lot of people in the west asked why do they hate us and start some of them even started blaming themselves looking what what could america have done there were numerous examples in American academia and media after 9-11 that placed the blame of 9-11 on American imperialism around the world. Uh, the message was, these people must be suffering so much if they're willing to blow up the World Trade Center. And they started saying, what could have we done to make them so angry at us? Is it our foreign policy? Is it us? Did, what did we do? From the Western eyes, that seems very logical. Why would someone go blow, blow up the World Center? Now, this message was given in academia, it was given in, in a significant part of the media, and it is unfortunate because, again, it is distracting the population from the real source of the problem, which is an ideology which wants to destroy the West. It's their duty to, to do jihad. <laughs> This clip was broadcast on Palestinian TV the day after London suffered four suicide terror attacks. Arab media plays a major role in public opinion. Arab dictators in order to survive, constantly incite their people against the West, the Jews, and the United States. This is how they survive, by telling their people 
they are all to blame except for us. There will always be some root cause in their effort to mobilize a population. There will be some grievance that they will cling to. It's a distraction, since we dictators aren't the enemy. We're like you, we're Arabs. The real enemy is the Jews. It is the West. It is modernism. Those are the things that are destroying the very fabric of our society. One of the main ways they get the people to be willing to fight and endanger their lives and to hate the West is to present the war as an act of self-defense. So in order for you to do jihad, you have to find a good reason. So the best reason is we're defending ourselves. We, there is an enemy out there who wants to get us. America wants to get us. They blame every little problem in the Arab society on the West. ثم حقيقة أمريكا هي في الغالب كما يثبت الواقع وراء جميع المشاكل. نعتبرها عدوة لأنها أكبر ناهب لثرواتنا ونفطنا وخيراتنا فيما يعيش مئات الملايين من أبناء أمتنا في البطالة والفقر والجوع والعزوبية والجهل والظلام ومشاكل Nothing could be done wrong by Arabs It's always the West if you want to get people to fight, you have to make them think that there's a threat and then they're in danger. This is an integral part, an integral part of Islamist propaganda. It recruits a lot of terrorists. That's the purpose of the Islamist uh, propaganda, is to make the people angry, hateful against the West, to be willing to fight them. This kind of indoctrination produced the terrorists of today. They are the natural product of indoctrination. In a television interview, an Arab intellectual admits that there is a distinct connection between propaganda and terrorism. أنا بقول إن فضائياتنا ينطبق عليه ما يسمى إعلام الإرهاب. نعم. تروج تروج طروحات تعصب يعني قد لا يكون إرهاب مباشر بس تروج تعصب تعصب والتعصب هي بداية العنف الغلو والعنف هو اللي يؤدي للإرهاب يعني ما هو تعصب تطرف عنف إرهاب. This propaganda throughout the Arab world has a very significant effect uh, on the adult population, on the children growing up. A child isn't born hating. A child has to be taught to hate. A child has to be taught to fear. Who 
هناك هناك خلل بنائي في الثقافة العربية أيضا في تمجيد العنف وفي عدم القدرة على إدارة الحوار السلمي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا لا On 9-11 with the destruction of the World Trade Center, there was a general response in the Muslim world of delight. With the, with the Palestinians, perhaps the most extravagant. Two weeks before 9-11, uh, the Mufti of Palestine, Ikrim al-Sabri, who is the senior religious figure uh, in the Palestinian Authority, on the radio openly prayed for God to destroy Israel, Britain, and the United States. <laughs> When you hear the same message over and over and over again, it becomes part of the way you see the world. In Pakistan, ordinary citizens are whipped up into a frenzy at the very sight of a burning American effigy. The scene repeats itself in Iraq. This time, it's not an effigy that's burnt, but American civilians whose vehicle was ambushed by Islamic militia. Iraqi civilians cheer as they throw rocks at the dead Americans in and around the blazing vehicle. Amidst shrieks of delight, the charred corpses are then dragged through the streets. A similar phenomenon occurred in the Sunni Muslim country of Somalia with the infamous Black Hawk Down incident. After US military helicopters were shot down, the bodies of American soldiers were stepped on, after which time, they were dragged through the streets. But hatred for the West is not limited to the Islamic world. Radical Islam has for years been spreading its ideology in the West. This jihad rally is taking place on the streets of London. The infiltration of radical Islam is so deep, it's shocking. And everyone's in denial about it. The minute you say, oh, this is an extremist group, you know, all of a sudden, it's, oh, you're not being politically correct. You have Al-Muhajirun, who's an open-fledged terrorist entity, speaking out on the streets, 
calling for Muslims to jihad against Britain. We've been infiltrated by people who want the Quran to replace our constitution. احنا رحنا انا رحت سنة 95 لقيت خطب بتقول ان هم منطلقين للبيت الابيض خلاص من 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 المساجد من بعض المساجد و يعني ايه منطلقين للبيت الابيض؟ يعني كان واحد بيقول في خطبته ان احنا ذاهبون دلوقتي الى البيت الابيض علشان ان شاء الله ينتصر الاسلام ويتحول البيت الابيض الى البيت المسلم يعني هيروحوا يحتلوا البيت الابيض يعني ولا لا ب ب ب ب ب بسواد الاسلام وافكاره سوف م. يتغير البيت الابيض the vast, vast, vast majority of Muslims who live in America or any of the other Western countries are loyal, good citizens who care about the future of their country and who would never dream of doing anything against the interests of their adopted country. Many of them were born in this country. So the one thing we can't do is stereotype, generalize. What we can do is be worried that there are those from within our own country that have been taught by extremists in extremist mosques and by extremist tapes that you can easily get today to hate the country you live in and to support only the most extreme elements of radical Islam dedicated to the destruction of Western values. That is a serious problem. Hamas has the largest infrastructure of all terrorist organizations on American soil today. They are not trying to be part of the American way of life. They are not trying to be part of our culture. They are here with an agenda to make Islam the law of the land. Just to show where our loyalty belongs to. You see this flag here? It's gonna go on the floor. And to us, our loyalty does not belong to this flag. Our loyalty belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! It's not illegal, nor should it be illegal to say death to America. It's protected speech. And in fact, Islamic groups understand that it is protected speech. Don't be afraid to speak out against injustice in this country. One of the loopholes of this government is they allow the freedom of expression. But it doesn't immunize those groups from being accountable for the radical views that they espouse. Of course, not all Muslims are like that. But we've been infiltrated with this kind of agenda. And... Uh, America has to wake up because we are strangling ourselves with our political correctness. There is tremendous deception in terms of saying one thing publicly and another thing privately. Yasser Arafat obviously was the master of this dual agenda in terms of openly supporting pluralism or nonviolence or condemning terrorism. I condemn completely these terrorist activities and then secretly or behind closed doors supporting it. Sometimes you would find a Muslim who appears to be moderate. We were the first, as you may remember, post September the 11th, who said that the actions of flying planes full of innocent civilians into buildings is not legitimate. But uh, in his deeds, uh, he's not uh, as moderate as uh, he is. We are here to talk about the Magnificent 19. Those who two years ago today split the world into two camps, into the camp of Islam and the camp of non-Islam or Kufr. Those who revived the obligation of Jihad worldwide. The Magnificent 19, they were praising the hijackers, celebrating the attacks on New York. The deception is so high and so successful that I'm afraid we're losing the battle. In order to expose British terror groups like Al Mahujaroon and supporters of Sharia, Glenn Genvy collaborated with Jonathan Galt and acquired recordings of the group's meetings held in London mosques. The tapes reveal open incitement to violence and terror, in particular from Abu Hamza al Masri, who calls upon followers to kill the Kufar or non Muslims. Abu Hamza, in one of the clips, is talking about the word Kufa, that if you are not a Muslim and you live in a Muslim land, 
you are like a cow. That's his work. You see, the Islamic rule, if a Kafir goes into a Muslim country and he's walking by, he's like a cow going, anybody could take him. That is the Islamic rule, and this is the opinion of the Fuqaha. It's not my opinion. If you read the books of, of Jihad, you'll see. You can take him to market. You can sell him. Uh, Kafir is walking by. He went, he went inside. You catch him. What, what, what are you doing here? Then he's a boot. You can sell him the market. You can kill him. If Muslims cannot take them to the, to the and you know, and sell them in the, in the market, then you just kill them. It's okay. Abu Hamza also engages in hate speech against America. America is a blackmailing nation which will take power until there is nobody in the planet out of its order. The new God of the planet and Allah will destroy America. Hamza is a speaker, he brainwashes people. He gets funding, he sends them to commit murder abroad. Al Mujahiroon is a UK-based Islamic pressure group with offices in Pakistan. 25-year-old Abdul Salam grew up in London's Brick Lane. Now he's a recruiter for the Taliban. What's your involvement in recruiting and training young British Muslims? Well, the Muslims from Britain, there's hundreds of them that come over uh, from Britain to uh, Pakistan or Afghanistan. And what we do is we supply them with weapons, clothing, we, f we feed them, we shelter them. Yeah, I'm British. British born, British bred. Are you willing to kill British soldiers? I'm willing to kill British soldiers simply because of the fact that they're engaging in a war that is against my brethren. The links from the UK go abroad and back. This is what makes it a global problem. If you take the, the London bombings, the bombers were from Britain, they're from the city of Leeds, a two-hour drive north of London. British Muslims, but British. I and thousands like me have forsaken everything for what we believe. We are at war and I'm a soldier. Now you too will taste the reality of this situation. We are living with them. They are here. They're not outside our borders, they are here. So when you ask, is radical Islam a threat to Europe, of course it is, because you find this, in, the very, this large and growing minority population that is growing more and more radical and rejects more and more blatantly, overtly and stridently the societies in which they operate. They are using our laws against us. They are using our democracy against us. And they know it. They know exactly what they're doing. When you think just from a military perspective, forgetting everything else, the September 11th hijackers trained for their mission to attack the United States inside the United States of America. That is something unbelievable. Here these 19 Arab Islamic fundamentalists come to the United States, dress like Americans, get American driver's license, register in American flight schools, and in American flight schools, they learn how to destroy the World Trade Center with American jetliners. That is an unbelievable thing. That means that you don't need necessarily to have geographical uh, uh, territory on, at your disposal because you can use the geography Use the territory of your enemies in order to destroy your enemies. That is uh, the most postmodern type of warfare we've ever seen. It is the first war where no state is involved. It is a transnational war with transnational actors that is spread across beyond state and cannot be controlled by state. In fact, they can themselves infiltrate states, influence states, but they are not state actors. That is what makes this war far more dif difficult to execute. I think the world, despite the number of attacks on various countries, is still in denial. They don't want to believe that someone has declared war on them. In the 1930s, the danger of Nazism was there. It was in everything Hitler wrote and said, in everything the Nazi authorities did. Dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die Bolschewisierung der Erde und damit der Sieg des Judentums sein, sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. In the corruption of a whole generation of 
German youth through the propaganda of Nazism in schools. But people thought, well, this is a German problem. It's a limited problem. Uh, we have our own problems. We have our unemployment. And I think the same is true today. They don't connect the dots. They don't connect the acts together. They don't see that Islamic fundamentalism is a global network and a global problem. There is no terrorist threat. There is no terrorist threat. Yes, there have been horrific acts of terrorism. And yes, there will be acts of terrorism again. But that does not mean that there's just some massive terrorist threat. Uh, we have to worry about terrorism. If terrorism had struck on the West Coast rather than the East Coast, some of the folks in Hollywood might have a somewhat different view. People don't want to feel that this is part of a single threat. Because if you come to that conclusion, and I'm sure it's the true conclusion, then you have to do something about it. If you ignore a real threat, like has happened in the past before World War II, uh, then the world will pay with many, many millions of dead. In Second World War, the West was sleeping. The Munich uh, Accords came to regarding to what should we do about this Adolf Hitler who wants to take over Czechoslovakia. So what did the parliament do in, in, in Great Britain? They got together and they said, well, we need to give Hitler land for peace. In return for Hitler's guarantee of world peace, Chamberlain and Eladje prevailed upon Czechoslovakia to give up the Sudetenland without a fight. In Britain, a happy Chamberlain came back declaring he had achieved peace, peace in our time. One of the most tragic and ironic scenes in all history. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. Chamberlain believed that they could do a deal with Hitler, that Britain and Germany had a special affinity. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. Winston Churchill had warned his country and his government that they were pursuing a disastrous course with regard to appeasing Germany. These gangs of bandits have sought to darken the light of the world, have sought to stand between the common people of all the lands and their march forward into their inheritance. Peace, it wasn't peace. By taking the Sudetenland, they had made Czechoslovakia defenseless. A ripe plum ready to fall into Hitler's lap. Within six months of declaring that he wanted no more territory anywhere, he violated the Munich Agreement. Austria and Czechoslovakia were gone without a fight. And Hitler was getting his control of Eastern Europe. Poland was next on the map. Churchill never considered himself a great leader. He always considered that he had failed because from 1933 to 1939 he had warned his country and his government. So when war came, and when in May 1940 he was asked to be Prime Minister, he felt he was only there because he had failed. That if he had been listened to, if the country had understood the German danger, if the country had allied with other states threatened by Germany, then this situation would never have come to pass that Hitler could have been deterred. Perhaps it could have been stopped. Perhaps millions of lives could have been saved. Today, the press, by minimizing the potential threats, by ignoring the potential threats, are doing a tremendous disservice to the West by not uh, alarming the people to what they should be uh, alarmed about. When you ignore what people are saying, when they're actively uh, on a daily basis, calling for your own annihilation, calling for the annihilation of your country. You're ignoring them at your own risk. The same thing is happening now again. History is repeating itself. 
I was a very intense believer in the Nazi ideology. And I know what uh, a supreme dedication to an ideology can do. From an early age, Alphonse Heck was influenced by the Nazi worldview. He joined the Hitler Youth at the age of 10, and by the end of World War II, he was a high-ranking officer of the Hitler Youth. It is absolutely correct to say, if you can't learn from the events of Nazi Germany, you will not be able to, to grasp the true intent of the danger of the radical Muslim world today. You're simply hiding. History has an unfortunate habit of always repeating itself. The idea that the radical Muslims have and that Nazis had is they demonize the Jews. You know, they, they just turn them into demons. And I mean, this is exactly what happened in Germany. Now, can you imagine, we were enlightened people and we fell for this. Why wouldn't Muslims fall for this? They are killing the infidels just like the preacher in the mosque told them to do. It's their duty to kill them. For Israel, از صحنه روزگار حذف نشود این فریادها به قوت خود باقی I watched anti-Semitism since I was young kid and now the world is reaping these eggs are hatching and what's coming out is literally uh, something that comes uh, out of Nazi Germany. Same as in Nazi Germany, the Boy Scouts in Nazi Germany, we had the youth. The youth was being robbed from being youth. <laughs> Arab children are being taught that Jews are inherently not human, that they are born uh, from monkeys and pigs, that it's perfectly all right to kill them, that is a command from Allah to kill all Jews. Muslim? 
I think the worst form of child abuse is teaching a child to hate. What we have on Palestinian TV and on Saudi TV over and over again are little kids being taught songs, I want to be a suicide bomber. The radical Muslims without any doubt learned from the Nazis in how to indoctrinate the young. You know, kids eight, six years old, nine years old, ten years old, teenagers watching cartoons. And what did they see? They see a, a depiction of, uh, of Sharon in this thing called Darakola. You got Coca-Cola, you got Darakola. But Darakola is Arab blood. And the youth who are listening to this day and night, what do you expect to happen? A Palestinian teenager showed up at a crowded West Bank checkpoint wearing a suicide bomb vest. Soldiers sent a yellow robot to hand scissors to the boy so he could cut off the vest. Once the boy was out of harm's way, the bomb vest was detonated. And I think this is a crime that the Muslim bird commits against his children. Hitler committed a crime against young Germans. It took me a long time to see that. But what the Muslims do to their own children is even worse. They tell Arab children that uh, Jews bake cookies with their blood. This is a scene from the television series Al Shatat. It was broadcast on satellite TV stations that reach hundreds of millions of viewers. Throughout the Middle Ages, there was this libel that the Jews needed uh, blood of a Christian child to make matzah. Now, of course, today the world knows this is totally, totally libelous accusation, no connection to truth at all. Yet the Al Shatat film was able to include uh, a video depiction of this ancient blood libel as if this is real Jewish ideology. <laughs> no shame in Arab media, in the, the degree they are ready to cover hate speech and lies, outright lies against the Western Israel. The ironic thing about this whole thing is that if you look at reality, you can see what we accused the Jews of doing. We carried it out literally literally cameras are there for the whole world to see it, but the world refuses to see. Shalom. Shalom. Fusah Majid. Fusah Majid. Hello.
When I see films like Shatat or broadcast during uh, Ramadan, uh, I see a recurring theme. Uh, I don't see anything new, in, in fact. Uh, I see attacks against Jews, I see an attempt to depict Jews as uh, bloodthirsty uh, people, as murderers, uh, as a people who would sacrifice Christian children uh, to drink their blood during their holiday. <laughs> هي ألز وأقدس لأنه معجون بدم نقي دم جزء. What is significant is not just the film, but the time in which it was shown. Ramadan is a time when people will look at the TV because they look. It is a month in which Muslims traditionally think there is a lot of blessing and there is a lot of religious education going around. So when you choose that month to show a particular film that is anti-Semitic, you are grabbing an almost captive audience. And it just shows you how dangerous propaganda could be. How could you possibly believe this uh, in the 21st century? How could you possibly believe this? And yet, they believe it because of the incessant propaganda. If you would have asked me when I was six years old, who are the worst people on the face of this earth? My answer would have been they're Jews. They ought to be killed. Israel, he had a wound. That is a nonsense. He is a law. He is a society. There is no future for him in our land. He is speaking about him. The blood and the shed. The death of Israel. Almost the first people who applauded Hitler's rise to power were the Arabs. The Nazis and the Islamists share a common conspiracy theory. The Jews control America, for example. This is the way that it is portrayed day in, day out in the Arab media. If you believe all that, then you are engaged in a war of survival for your very existence. نواجه معركة أكبر بكثير مما تتصورون إننا نواجه معركة مع الصليبية نواجه معركة مع الصهيونية العالمية And in that sense it's identical to Nazi propaganda This is a war of propaganda in which the same techniques of subversion that we saw earlier in the challenge posed by fascism and Nazism are repeating themselves. The propaganda of Islam is very similar to the propaganda of Nazism. It's the same hate speech, paranoia, and us against them. Here is a critical point that is generally overlooked. The anti-Semitism of the Nazis had a great appeal already in the mid-1930s to many Arab nationalists and Islamic fundamentalists. From the mid-30s, from 1936 on, Hitler and his propaganda sections made a great effort to win over the Arab peoples of the Middle East. We see that the undisputed leader of the Palestinian Arab national movement of the 1920s, 1930s and 40s, uh, Haj Amin al-Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, was a fervent admirer of Adolf Hitler. The Mufti was one of the founders of the radical Islamic movement, and Hitler saw at once that this man not only could serve his purpose, but wanted to serve his purpose. 
there is a very important meeting between Hitler and the Mufti of Jerusalem on the 28th of November 1941 of which we have a full protocol and what Hitler explains is that this is first and foremost a war of extermination against Jewry and he tells him to lock this secret in his heart he is revealing it to the Mufti it's extraordinary he should choose the leader of the Palestinian Arab national movement for this revelation which is an official German document it seemed strange to us that a Mufti who was not a pure Aryan was being received by Hitler but they said, no, we have the same goal, which is the extermination of the Jews. The Mufti was sent to the Balkans, where he raised a Bosnian Muslim SS division. He had several SS divisions, the Hanshar division, for example, where they had nominally Croatian officers, but the rank and file of the unit were entirely Muslim, Arab Muslims, and they were bringing them in from all over the world. I was utterly astonished that the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem had raised a Panzer division of Bosnian Muslims to fight along the Waffen SS. The fanatic Muslim world and Hitler both agreed that no ideology can exist beyond theirs. It's all encompassing. A secular dogma like Nazism is less dangerous than Isla this Islamo-fascism that we see today. It's less dangerous because Islamo-fascism has a religious twist to it. It says God the Almighty ordered you to do this, not the Fuhrer, you know. So it is way more dangerous. It's trying to grow itself in 55 Muslim states. So potentially, you could have a success rate of several Nazi Germanys if these people get their way. Hitler's gone and dead. The German people are not uh, the Nazis of 1944. But the Muslims uh, have, have never wavered in their goal, which really is, if they possibly could, to kill all of the Jews. I'm convinced of that. If radical Islamic fundamentalists had their way, we would have another Holocaust. There's absolutely no doubt about that. If uh, Al-Qaeda could produce it, they would. But what begins with the Jews never ends with the Jews, as the West, and Europe in particular, is slowly but surely beginning to understand. <laughs> Jews are the prologue. After the Jews come the real issues. Whatever happens to Israel, eventually is going to be the fate of the world. Israel presents the warning. Islam is superior than the Jews, than the Christians, than the Buddhists, than the Hindus. The only deen Allah accepts is Al-Islam. And whoever seeks any other deen apart from Islam will never be accepted. And the Christians are kafirs. And you may say to yourself, no, 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 they're innocent. No Kafir is innocent. Two blasts just minutes apart, outside two churches in Baghdad, as those inside worshipped. And you too will make your destruction, because Allah's religion will prevail on this earth. <laughs> The 
have been very clear about it. They're the same as Hitler's goals, you know. Uh, kill all the Jews, crush the democracies, destroy Western civilization. They wish to strike down the West. They want to defeat the West. They want to defeat Christianity. They want to defeat Judaism. They want to spread Islam in their own way. It's very clear. We've heard it so many times from many Muslim leaders that they want to Islamize the world. در جغرافیا و زمان محدود نمی شود تردید نکنید که انشاءالله اسلام همه کجا رو فتح خواهد کرد همه قله های جهان رو فتح خواهد کرد قد حکمنا الدنیا و سیعتی یوم والله نحکم فیه کل الدنیا سیعتی یوم نحکم فیه امریکا سیعتی یوم نحکم فیه بریطانیا و نحکم فیه کل العالم Radical Islamic groups want to see the world unified under Islam. It's only a matter of time until we rule Earth, until we control Earth. One day, this very flag will fly over the parliament in London. We will see this flag that will fly over the White House. And we will see the Black House, the Kaaba, will take over the whole world. Islam to the world. You will take over USA. You will take over UK. You will take over Europe. You will defeat them all. You will get victory. You will take over Egypt. We trust in Allah. Indeed, that is me who sent this messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, with the deed of Hak, with Islam, to dominate all of our other religions, to dominate the United States, to dominate the world, even though the non-Muslims may hate it. At the end of the day, Islam must control earth, whether we like it or not. It's a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a promise from Rasulullah subhanahu wa ta'ala. as a European war has developed as the Nazis always intended it should develop into a war for world domination. It is coming very close to home. Will our children too wander off in search of new gods? We do not accept, we will not permit this Nazi shape of things to come. We know that these people act in the name of Islam. But we also know that the vast and overwhelming majority of Muslims here and abroad are decent and law-abiding people who abhor this act of terrorism every bit as much as we do. So if they truly want to bring out the compassion and peace element in Islam. They really have to behave like it. They have to teach it in their schools. احنا ما نجحنا في ان نحبب اولادنا الى الحياه. نعم. علمناهم كما قيل كيف يموتون في سبيل الله. نعم. ولكننا لم نعلمهم كيف يحيون في سبيل الله. It is the duty of all moderate Muslims to stand up and speak against the hate, to speak against the jihad. In هؤلاء أيها الإخوة الكرام هم من أعداء الإسلام. In هؤلاء الذين يشوهون صورة الإسلام من أعداء الإسلام. 
if they don't agree with it, then let us hear your voices. We want to hear the voices. And the Western world need to stand up and support the voices of the moderate, the very few who are speaking out. The Western world need to support them, need to do everything we can to empower them. It would be a terrible disservice to those Muslims who are liberal, who are democratic, who are modern, who want to live a civilized life, to throw them in with the barbarians because they are on the right side. And more than that, they have a great deal to offer in the war against militant Islam. It is through hope and education that we will be able to win this war and accomplish peace. It's important that those engaged in terrorism realize that our determination to defend our values and our way of life is greater than their determination to cause death and destruction to innocent people in a desire to impose extremism on the world. Ultimately, the price we're talking about is the price of freedom. In every generation, I think, we're called upon, at some point, to stand up for that ideal. There is no evil that I'm aware of in, in history that has simply disappeared of its own accord. recognize the danger and you don't do anything about it, you are risking uh, your demise. We cannot claim ignorance anymore. Where evil triumphs, it is because there were not enough good people to stand up to defeat it.